almost like a fact finding feel like a detective is sort of going into their lives and trying to really understand you know what is actually motivating or triggering a specific behavior even though to you it sounds very counterintuitive so i hope it brings me joy uh, in professional life and then of course you know the impact that if you are actually able to design something which can talk to that person talk to that person's life and bring about that positive change of course that's very fulfilling <laughs> Welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series presented by Carnegie India. The series is a curation of stories highlighting empowerment, struggle, and success uh, among women professionals in diverse fields across the globe. Uh, these are also stories that we hope will inspire young professionals on their own journeys. Hello, I'm Kavya Palavalsa, currently a research assistant and program coordinator with the political economy team at Carnegie India. Today we are honored to have with us Pooja Haldia. Um, welcome, Pooja. And so, Pooja, with over two decades of experience across social across the social sector, development, and private sectors, Pooja is an expert in the area of applied behavioral science. Her work focuses on how to use behavioral science for greater impact, especially in areas such as public health, nutrition, data privacy, and financial inclusion. She is a co-founder and senior advisor at Ashoka University's Center for Social and Behavioral Change. She also helped set up the first behavioral insights unit, the Nudge Unit, within the Indian government. Pooja, welcome to the show. Um, we're really excited to have you here and to learn more about your journey and the work that you do. Thanks, Kavya. I'm also excited to be here today. Yeah. I will start off with our first question. So you first studied mathematics at St. Stephen's and then proceeded to do an MBA at IIM Bangalore. Could you describe this journey a little bit for us? Yeah, it's a, for, just let me talk about the journey. So, uh, you know, ever since I mean, I can remember, I was always interested in, you know, how, why people behave the way they do. But when I was young, I did not know at that point how I could convert that into a career. Um, so I wanted to study psychology at school, but you know, in the nineties, they said you could do the sciences and you ended up doing the sciences. And from there I went down a well-trodden path. I did, you know, mathematics, then I did my, uh, MBA and, and even when I was doing my MBA, you know, the class that actually I found most exciting or inspiring was consumer behavior. So that was a class, which, you know, I, I remember being enamored by the whole subject. Uh, I went into consulting. I was in consulting. I was in McKinsey for 10 years. But even when I was in McKinsey, I was always attracted to projects which had this element of behavior insights in it. So, you know, I worked, for example, with a, a, a large direct sales company on what do Indian women want when it comes to uh, door to door selling. Or, you know, I worked with a big media con conglomerate on how do you increase readership, how do you increase viewership. So, even the projects that I was doing at McKinsey, uh, the ones that I enjoyed the most had that that uh, bit of behavior in it. Uh, I think after 10 years in consulting, you know, there came a time I took a sabbatical. I said, uh, you know, I am quite clear now about what is the exact thing that I'm passionate about, what I'm interested in. So it's time to take that jump and make it into, you know, a full career and to, you know, take it from there. And uh, from there, you know, I mean, it was, I was trying to see what, what should I do? And of course, the more obvious thing would be to just get into a research organization. But research or market research as it existed then, especially, you know, it was not, uh, it was uh, the methodologies that they were using that was quite dated. Uh, nothing new was happening in that field. And so by chance, I mean, I was just going through all the, uh, the organizations which exist in this space. And I, I came across this organization called Brain Juicer. And I thought, oh, what is it that they do? And um, they basically were using behavior science, which 10 years back was a very emerging field in uh, working mainly with private sector companies on how they can make their marketing, marketing communication research more impactful. 
So I had set up their India office, uh, and that was actually my entry into this field of applied behavior science. Uh, with Brain Juicer, we did almost 150 projects in India. Very exciting work, but all private sector focused work. I mean, one of the work that we did, for example, was working again with one of the big media companies on which soaps, uh, you know, they, they made uh, daily soap, uh, soap opera. So which soaps would actually resonate, what storylines would resonate more with audience or not, and use very uh, innovative techniques, you know, to actually do that. So I did that, and then in between, I also, uh, you know, took some breaks. I have three, I have three boys, so that happened, and then uh, took another sabbatical, and then this opportunity came, you know, with CSBC, which was, uh, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was very interested in setting up, uh, along with Ashoka, first of its kind center, which is a center for social and behavior change. This was in 2017, uh, and the mandate of the center, the mission of the center, was how can we use behavior science to uh, improve programs and policies of the government on the ground. So it was a very impact-oriented organization. How do we take what exists in the academic world already, the literature exists, but then how do we take this into real life and have impact on the ground? Uh, nothing like that had actually been done in India before, and so I was very excited by the opportunity of helping set up this center. And so that's where this entry into, you know, this, uh, the development Okay, thank you so much. Um, I guess this speaks a little bit already to what our next question. Um, but uh, what what we wanted to know was so clearly behavior science lies at the center um, for you in addressing key and emerging concerns like climate change, public health, data privacy, and financial inclusion. And clearly, from what you've said, this is it's a fairly it's, it's a field that has been introduced quite recently. Um, in India, developments are quite recent, like 2017 is when there was a growing interest. And um, so I guess the question is, so could you describe the field a little more in India, how it works across sectors and disciplines, and why it is important, especially today. And I think what I also found interesting was how, like bridging that gap between theory and practice and that kind of circle. So um, maybe if you could speak a little bit more about the field um, and even perhaps the methods, uh, how they're changing. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the fact that behavior matters, I think that has been intuitively understood forever. Uh, I think where the field emerged was more where people started thinking about, you know, what's the science behind it? Uh, I think when Daniel Kahneman won his Nobel Prize and he was the first to win it as an economist, but there was this in behavioral economics, I think that's where this interest emerged that, uh, yes, of course, behavior matters, but is there is there something that we can very methodically go about doing in this field? And I think that's where this field sort of emerged. Uh, and I think when we talk about behavior science, it's beyond just communication. It's, it's uh, you know, marketing, for example, has existed forever. And uh, marketing, of course, focuses a lot on communication. Uh, and the whole field of marketing comes from uh, working on the motivation part of it. You know, can I increase the intent to do a certain behavior? But of course, you've always known that intent is only the first part of the puzzle. I mean, you may have the best intent, but the action does not happen. So there is this intent to action gap. And I think behavior science essentially looks at that entire thing saying, yes, of course, intent is needed. We must create the intent. But then we need two other things. We need to uh, increase the ease with which things are done. So that's the ability part of it. You know, can we make it the behavior easier? Can we increase the ability of people to do that behavior? And then the last bit is, so you have the intent, you have the motivation, you have now the, uh, you know, the ability to do it. But then that last bit is what we call nudge, which is how do I then close this gap between intent to action by providing triggers uh, in the environment, in your social environment, in your physical environment, so that you actually end up doing that behavior. So in that sense, behavior science is looking at it from end to end. It's not just intent, it's intent closing the intent to action gap. And I think therefore, behavior science, when we look at uh, the applications that it has, of course, there are, you know, when you talk about behavioral interventions, they have to do with communication. A lot of behavioral interventions are communication oriented. But then a lot, it's much broader than that because a, interventions can also be around, uh, for example, better process design. You know, how do you make a process easier? It could be around product design. You know, how do I make a product better, easier, you know, 
again to use and then i talk about digital products it becomes about ui ux design you know how do i design the interface um to meet my objectives uh, it can also be of course there are implications on policy as well uh, you know how do you design policies around uh, in, as far as government is concerned so davis has kind of then uh, actually is talking to many different disciplines so there's the communication part of it but there's the product the ui ux design there's policy angle to it i mean very recently for example we used uh, again principles of behavior science in even designing training curriculum so you know what is the best way to train we were working with uh, rural women for upi uptake you know and we wanted to increase their confidence because we thought that was a gap so then we applied a lot of behavior science principles on designing a training program will not only increase knowledge but also confidence so that's so in that sense behavior science therefore actually is a, it kind of spans many different uh, disciplines in itself and of course experimentation is at a heart, at the heart of it so you can design everything but then the science part of it is that then we do experiment in the digital world that's ab testing in the uh, online uh, offline world that's you know maybe rcts randomized control trials or other methodologies you know that we use so that's the you know that's that's what behavior science you know in its entirety looks like the thing is that it's applicable across sectors you mentioned some of the sectors before but if i just give you some examples of the kind of work we've done so for example in financial inclusion we worked on things uh, i talked about upi uptake uh, but we also you know have are working currently let's say on digital savings how do we get women to save more uh, we have worked on pension products very hard to sell them but how do we create uh, you know that uh, how do we motivate people how do we get them to invest into pension products so that's about uptake of products a lot of our work in financial inclusion is around that in uh, climate for example we've done a lot of uh, interesting work and it, it the problems are are very varied so for example how do we get people to adopt electric vehicles or shift uh, them from private to public transportation uh, how do we get people to reduce electricity usage or buy five star acs instead of three star acs um how do we get them to actually eat more locally sourced seasonal vegetables so you can just understand and, and then again in health which is of course a big field in which we work everything from you know how do we ensure women exclusively breastfeed their children to pregnant women how do we ensure that they take 180 pills that they have to take of you know the iron supplements so the problems that we actually work on and csbc as well you know the the work that that we do is actually sector agnostic because you can take literally every sector there will be a behavioral challenge there uh, and so as i said i mean behavior science again then its applicability is across sectors and i think why it's become even more important today see in the development sector we've been a bit slow in actually taking the the science which has been understood and applying it into practice also because there are practical challenges in uh, being able to pilot and so on at a large scale but the tech world has been using behavior science for a while and all of us have been you know the uh, recipients or whatever you want to call it of of behavior, you know some companies like booking.com for example i mean they they do thousands of experiments every year on how behavior science can be used for anything uh, you know in, to increase engagement for example it could be how do you get to sell more how do you create and in everything from personalized feed that you get from push notifications you get the red dot that you get you know which just makes you uncomfortable and you just need to press it i mean all of that is behavior science so in some sense you know the tech world has been using it for a while and now as india is getting more uh, tech enabled and more and more people have smartphones a lot of our work is about how can we use this technology for good if everyone has a smartphone they're easy to reach they are accessible so you know the other day we were talking to an organization streaks is a very important thing in snapchat where people want to continue you know their streaks and so on and so forth so we were talking about you know in a savings product can we actually use a similar kind of uh, mechanism and and you know do you think that it would work in that in in, in you know in that context so uh, as so as i said i mean uh, you know just to sort of summarize i think you know behavior science uh, more than marketing we work on intent ability triggers uh, as i said many disciplines which come under it uh, marketing product design process design policy the applicability across sectors pretty much any sector that we work there is a behavioral challenge and i think with the tech coming in uh, the potential of behavior science and for it to be used at scale for good that is quite phenomenal yeah i that's actually really interesting um just that it is something that really seems to bring in 
um, it seems to work across disciplines, but also requires people from different disciplines to re really come in and work together. And there's nothing that we need more, um, especially in light of the challenges that we face today. Um, so our next question is that, um, so you've already spoken about this a little bit, but your work seems to really actively involve working at the community level for communities and with communities. So what does it really mean to design behavior change interventions and frameworks? And um, you've spoken about scale a little bit. So how do you decide at what scale these interventions really need to be made? Uh, okay, so just to let me take you a little bit through the process of how, you know, when we say applying behavior science, what does that even mean? So it initially starts with the first step, which is that you need to define the problem that you're trying to solve. And I think one has to be cognizant of the fact that not every problem is a behavioral issue. I mean, some problems are infrastructural issues, some are, you know, supply side issues. So everything is not behavioral. So first, of course, you know, whenever we get into this work, we try and define the specific behavior that we want to change and be comfort or at least have that comfort that this issue is indeed behavioral. If we want to solve the bigger problem, behavior is, you know, the key piece that needs to be solved. Once we've done that, actually, that's then we come to the heart of the process, which is first is diagnosis where you are actually going into the field with your target segment, mostly doing qualitative work, really trying to understand what are the current barriers which prevent the behavior from happening. And I told you before, I mean, we look at barriers which comes to motivation that, okay, maybe they don't want to do the behavior. It could be that it's on the ability side that the behavior is too difficult. Or it could be that, you know, they just aren't, they are not getting that last mile, last push, you know, to actually do that behavior, whether it's a reminder or some sort of a trigger or whatever, that's not happening. So that, so we do this diagnosis in the ground. It's very important, for example, to un this diagnosis, this diagnosis space is very important because you have to understand the context of your target segment. I mean, a very interesting example comes to mind when we were doing some work in um, privacy and financial inclusion and so on and so forth. You know, we went with a mindset of understanding, okay, for rural women, you know, what does privacy mean? And usually we understand privacy in a certain way. You know, people like you and me, we think of privacy in a certain way. But when it came to financial products, for example, a lot of women said actually the privacy that they needed and why they like to store money in cash and not on a digital product was that they needed privacy from their family members or their husbands. They did not want them to know how much money you know they had saved. So this diagnosis is very important because you need to understand the context of what your target segment is doing. If they're not using, for example, a digital savings product, you realize, okay, one of the big concerns they have is privacy from their own family members. And so when you go into the next phase, you know, these are the kind of things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, and when you're doing this uh, sort of uh, diagnosis, you look at the barriers, but you also may look at facilitators, you may look at positive deviants, you may look at, you know, that one woman who is indeed saving every month and you want to go and understand, you know, what is enabling her to do it, you know, what are the facilitators in her life. So that's the diagnosis phase, right? You have a lot of, you know, barriers and facilitators and then you go into the design phase where you say, okay, now I have these barriers, I have some ideas in from the facilitators, now let me come up with some design ideas on what, or, or intervention ideas on what could help overcome the barriers I've seen in the field. Uh, and the idea there is, you know, how can I make that behavior more attractive? Uh, and in that sense, you know, more aligned with the person's goal, more aligned with, you know, making it more fun. Uh, how do I make that behavior more easy, which I've already talked about. Sometimes you're looking at how do I make that behavior a little bit more social? Because we are all social animals, you know, if most people are doing a certain behavior that's the norm you're more more likely to follow wow. so can you add a social component you know to the behavior and then of course you think about the timeliness you know when is the right time for interventions if you want to let's say do a savings product probably the right time of intervention maybe when they get the salary so you need to think a little bit about timing you know what's the right time to deliver an intervention and so you come up with a whole list of intervention ideas and then you narrow down based on you know many criteria including what is feasible what is doable but also where you think the impact would be most and then of course we go into the testing phase where if it's a digital intervention we could be tested if it's actually an offline intervention then you go on the field you do a pilot uh, you learn from that pilot uh, and from that then the idea is you know let's take it to scale. So most of these projects when we are doing, we are working with either the government directly or we are working with an implementation partner so that after we have evidence that, look, this intervention does work, 
uh, that partner or the government entity involved can then take it to scale. Most of it actually happens at a state level. And that's what we are usually gunning for, that if we are doing a pilot in a few districts, we are hoping that the aim is at least at a state level, this would be implemented. So that's the, the objective that we have in mind. So I just wanted to say that obviously all of this is made much easier now because, because of technology. It's much easier to both design as well as pilot interventions. And so uh, the timelines that are now needed and the costs involved to do some of this testing is only reducing. So I think uh, you know there's a lot more potential earlier. We were kind of restricted by the number of pilots you can run on the ground. But now, increasingly, we are doing a lot of digital interventions. Um, and so, you know, just, just I wanted to share one example on this, which is that um, we have found WhatsApp uh, and the creation of WhatsApp groups to be a very powerful means of bringing about behavior change. And it's, again, a very simple thing to sort of uh, put in place. And this is about creating WhatsApp groups of peers. Uh, we have done this, for example, in postal agents in India, uh, Post Payments Bank, where we put all agents in a, in a group. And we found that, and, and we use those groups to give them some information about incentives, but also create a healthy sense of competition and collaboration. We have used these groups for parents in rural India for them to get more involved in their children's education. We have used these WhatsApp groups with young mothers to see, you know, whether they can actually improve the diet diversity, share recipes uh, with each other on, you know, what they can uh, feed their six, six month, two year old child. And so, uh, basically, so this, so, now we are we are always looking for interventions which are um, much easier to scale and potentially reach directly to the end user. So I think digital has become like a huge part of the work that we do now. I think that's really interesting. I think uh, the stories are really insightful, and um, I I think what I what I I really want to know more about is. Clearly, this involves a lot of, um, as you said, like experiments and running projects on the ground. So I think also want, what I really want to know is um, what, like, what are your experiences as a woman on the field who is interacting with other women and who is um, actively, at, I mean, especially from the point of behavior, I mean, from the point of view of behavior, um, what have your experiences been like on the field as a woman who is investigating behavior? Uh, so I think there are two parts to your question. What has my experience been as a woman? And then, of course, what have I learned from the women, you know, in the field? And what am I seeing? Uh, I think, you know, as far as my own experience as a woman is concerned, uh, it has been one of the most fulfilling experience. Uh, and what you realize is that a lot of the times, because of low literacy levels, often because of low literacy levels and of course the power dynamics in the household. A lot of the things that we have typically directed towards women, especially the, the rural women, has been very paternalistic in nature, has been very sort of speaking down, has been very education oriented. You know, the whole mindset has always been that, you know, because this, these are not educated women, they are come from low income, low education backgrounds, the way to bring about behavior change is by educating them, you know, and so even if you take something like financial inclusion, there has been a disproportionate uh, focus given to digital literacy. You know, as if that, uh, as if you and I, you know, if we ever, when we learned how to do a financial uh, sort of, uh, let's say, whatever we did, digital finance, it's not that we ever went through a class. It's not that anybody made us sit and made us understand, you know, what the different products are. How do people typically learn? I mean, when you need something, when something is actually going to be of use to you, you learn it. Uh, if something is not of use to you, the products that you make are not talking to me, they're not working, you know, for my needs, then I don't, you know, I don't adopt it. So one of the learnings, one of the big learnings we had, and I had earlier on, is that, you know, too much of focus is paid on education and information giving. Too little focus is played, paid on, is the product, the intervention, the behavior actually aligned to that person's goals? You know, even when we talk about savings, you know, and this is again, I'm bringing it up because our savings products are not, uh, they are not suited for a woman who wants to save five to 10 rupees every day. I mean, that, that, that's, and this is how this person saves. So by giving her financial literacy, 
you know that's not the answer the answer is that you need to understand her life her needs and then uh, create products programs policies which speak to her so i think one of my learnings you know has and experience has been that you know we need to move away from this let's top down teach educate uh, make them literate to more about you know actually make products programs policies which meet their realities which meet their needs um and i think one of the other things that are that we found is that you know education is one thing but i think there is a confidence gap a lot of their times it's not that the women don't know what they want or they are, they, they, they don't understand it or the knowledge is not there but there is a gap in confidence so that's been another learning that how when you are actually putting in place whatever programs policies products can you also work on that confidence can you just work a little bit on increasing the confidence not just knowledge not just training not just literacy so i think those two would be you know my key learnings from working with uh, women especially in the rural semi urban setting in india yeah that's really interesting in terms of what kind of a shift in thinking is required to make sure we're effective um yeah so um thank you so our next question is um so you've already spoken about technology a little bit um so i think that so clearly our relationship with technology is really complicated so could you elaborate a little bit on how you use and understand technology in your work um okay so technology yes are you right that our relationship is complicated i think when it comes to ethics as well i think uh, that's a big topic when we are looking at technology uh so if i do answer your question i would say that look at any point uh, one has to be cognizant of the pros and cons of using technology uh on one side or on one hand as i've said you know we use technology to great advantage to a you know make the dissemination of an intervention more quicker more direct to the user and so on and so forth on the other end we need to be mindful of the fact that yes technology can be so for example one of the big issues in technology let's take privacy as we understand right data privacy that's that's a huge issue you know you are uh, you are actually when when you are using technology when you are in the realm of you know looking at data data privacy and those issues and that has to be always in our mind in fact uh, we've done a lot of work in data privacy and uh, our work actually shows that uh, when it comes to privacy related decisions it's quite unfair to put that onus of responsibility on the users even the most educated even the most informed users uh, are unable to you know at that point of time when they want to immediately access a service really engage in the long term sort of harms that may come from data sharing so this whole area of informed consent for example is is quite a tricky one that one has to keep in mind when you're you know working with technology um uh, and i think that the other thing in technology is that when you make a behavior easy and so you're kind of almost nudging people to engage in a certain behavior the converse of it should also be true that is that not doing that behavior should also be easy for that con- for that user so we should not add a uh, sludge you know that's the term that uh, cas sunstein is using the opposite of nudge we shouldn't add sludge to the process to make a behavior more difficult so for example if i want to enroll you into an insurance scheme or, and and i make that very easy for you but at any point if i want to get away from or, or i want to un uh, you know I, i want to remove myself from that scheme that should be easy so i think that transparency uh is very important making sure that the administrative burden on people is less so just as technology can be made used to make things easy it can also be made used to make things difficult so again managing that is quite important so if i had to summarize i would say that yes technology very important it is a it's a big tool in our arsenal to be able to reach consumers very quickly very easily and it's something that people find very engaging so that's great i think privacy is something data privacy consent is something that we have uh, you know that's something that we need to be mindful of and i think lastly uh, while technology makes things easier we should also make sure that technology is also not being used to make other things difficult so the choice should always be in the hand of the user thank you um that actually that really sums up like the kind of considerations that we need to have in mind when we're thinking about technology um so again you you've brought up nudge and now you've uh, spoken a little bit about sludge a little bit uh so you 
led a project that set up the first behavior insights unit, which was called the Nudge Unit uh, within the Indian government. So could you tell us a little bit more about that work? Um, and what is the role of the government in this nudging process? Sure. So I think the Nudge Unit, uh, well, firstly, it's not called the Nudge Unit. I'll come to it for a second. There's a reason why we didn't call it the Nudge Unit. Uh, we, uh, it was essentially set up, the first one was set up in uh, within Niti Aayog, within central government. Now, of course, uh, we have set up uh, similar units uh, in, in state governments. So two are already running and three more are being set up. So that's the, you know, so we are hoping to not just have it at the central level, but actually have it at the state level. Because as I mentioned before, you know, change does happen uh, at the state level. Um, see, the whole, this whole nudge revolution essentially started in the UK uh, with the behavioral insights team where uh, when they were working with the tax department, uh, when in the mailer that they were sending to, to, to people on uh, paying their taxes on time, they added one line and so, so the story goes, which says that, you know, 83% or I don't remember the exact number, percentage of people pay their taxes on time, so should you. So this is known as social norms messaging, which is basically you're letting people know what is the expected or what is the uh, behavior expected from you so you don't be in the minority. And it's said that, you know, a simple act of adding that line where you're telling people that the majority are playing on, paying on time, so should you apparently led to billions of dollars of worldly taxes uh, for the British government. And so that's where this whole revolution started that governments should also be using and can and should be thinking about using behavior science in the programs and policies that they have on the ground. Uh, in India, why we didn't call it nudge unit is because technically nudge is uh, something which closes the intent to action gap. That's how we think about nudge. In India, we did feel that for a lot of the pro pro uh, problems that we were working on, the intent also needed to be worked on. So it was not just about closing the gap we wanted to work also in intent. Now, that's the role typically in the private sector marketing phase. But our units actually do look at communication, at intent creation, and so on and so forth. So we said, okay, let's call it a behavioral insights unit. It's not just about the nudging part of it, which is the intent uh, to action closing, but also creation of the intent. So that's how the whole uh, behavioral insights unit got started. Now, what's the government role? Now, let me, I'll actually take you through an example, and through, with, through it, I'll go through what the government's role in this is. So I was talking to you about anemia, you know, that's a problem that we've been working on for years. And one of the ways, one of the big things that you need to uh, do is that when women are pregnant in their third and fourth, uh, second and third trimester, they need to take 180 pills, uh, which are these iron and folic uh, supplements. And the thing is, government has done a very good job on sorting the supply side. So the pills are available, they are given to the women, but we have an issue of adherence, you know, women are not taking the pills. And anemia is, of course, you know, for pregnant women especially, it's quite a dangerous uh, condition to have. Now, if you have a problem like that, you know, what, where can the government use behavioral science in solving this problem? So it starts right from the policy side. So it could be things like, you know, at the policy level, even deciding you know, which is a more trusted environment for a woman. So therefore, where and who should be distributing it? You know, should it be done at the Anganwadi Center? Should the Asha worker be doing it? So, uh, how many pills do you give at a time? You know, we've thought about it that currently we give 180 pills. Is that the right way? Or do women devalue the pills because you get 180? Should you or get overwhelmed by so many pills? So should you be actually giving 30, 30, 30? So this is at the policy level trying to decide, uh, keeping behavior in mind, you know, uh, what should the policy say? That's the first step. Second is, okay, now you've decided the policy. There is the there is also use of behavior science at the supply side, which is the medical system or the health workers who are actually now going to be distributing the, the pills. Do they know uh, what kind of counseling they need to give? Have you made their job easier in giving that counseling? Uh, you know, the, uh, do they know, for example, when they're talking to women about anemia, what is the language they're using? Are they linking it to the blood test that they've just done five minutes back, which gives the woman a hemoglobin level? So there is things which needs to be done at the supply side so that the health workers, or in the case of financial inclusion, could be banking correspondents, uh, not only know what they need to do, but also because they are also quite overwhelmed, uh, you are making the job a little bit easier for them. So, for example, it could be something as simple as a standardized visual counseling card, which just makes it very simple. These are the three messages that you must give to a woman. Visually, you can just show it to her. It could be one, you know, such idea. So then that's at the supply level. Then, of course, the more traditional use of behavior science, which is at the 
consumer level or the user level at that pregnant woman level how do i motivate her uh, how do i make it easy for her to take the pill and then most importantly you know how do i ensure that every morning for 180 days she remembers to take the pill uh and again so that's that's where the government can put things in place uh to make sure that uh, a of course there are informational or communication or awareness programs about telling women uh, you know how how anemia can impact you but as i said that's just the motivation side but there are other things that you could do i mean we've tried many interesting things like giving women scratch cards so that every time you know they take a pill they can scratch uh, a number and it's you know, sort of visible it's hanging in their room so they are kind of every day seeing that they are coming closer to their goal which we know from behavior science it works uh, you know as a very powerful motivator uh we also try things like giving them daily reminders through smss or digital medium so that they remember to take the pill so that's the third level at which you know the government can put things into place which is at the user level to ensure that the behavior happens so and of course at the last is that you know um anything that actually does work or where there is very strong evidence that it leads to uh, the desired behavior how do you then incorporate it you know into the budgets into the plans you know for the coming year so how do you scale it of course that's the government's role but as i was saying for at the policy level at the supply level and at the demand level there is a use of behavior science which you know that that can make a program a policy uh, much stronger on the ground yeah i think i think there's a I think we can, I can now clearly see how behavior can be used to make comprehensive policy like make sure that there's a lot of like clearly go back and forth about looking at where things are not working and where things might and this really seems to give some insight into that moving on to perhaps lighter questions but uh the question is that what part of your work brings you joy and because work is so central to our lives so what part of your work brings you joy and i guess generally what brings you joy in life so i think there is a lot of consistency in what uh, in my professional life and personal life brings me joy i think uh, i mentioned it right at the beginning you know i am fascinated by people i do get a lot of joy when i uh, especially when i have insights about someone else's behavior uh, i think in the professional life it's obvious you know a lot of the work that i do, it is very challenging and very interesting problems and often you know you'll you'll uh, you'll come up with you know an understanding or an insight that you didn't start with uh, especially about you know why a person is behaving a certain way especially because from the outside it seems all wrong and you are trying to sort of understand that you know why would they do this i mean it's obvious that this is you know this product or this behavior is good for them you know why would they do it and then going a little bit you know it's almost like a fact finding feel like a detective is sort of going into their lives and trying to really understand you know what is actually motivating or triggering a specific behavior even though to you it sounds very counterintuitive so that what brings me joy uh, in professional life and then of course you know the impact that if you are actually able to design something which can talk to that person talk to that person's life and bring about that positive change of course that's very fulfilling i think even in personal life you know forming deep meaningful connection with people um you know that that actually brings me a lot of joy I, as i mentioned earlier you know i have three boys that i'm raising and so you know even seeing them develop into uh, three distinct individuals with understanding you know they looking at their behavior and their motivation what they are shaping up to be that's that brings a lot of joy as well so yeah thank you and um our last question is um so what developments in your field do you find particularly exciting and promising and also for people and especially women who are looking to enter the field and are aspiring to make a difference in the field uh what advice would you give based on your journey see i think what i find interesting about this field as i've you know we've talked about touched upon it a little bit is that with technology i think this field can have quicker uh, and you know sort of more scalable impact and i think that's what is exciting right now with the smartphone penetration reaching where it's reaching i think the potential of harnessing that leveraging that uh, i think that's that's very exciting uh, you know for me i think we've also just barely scratched the surface of bringing a few disciplines together so you know there's marketing there's product design there's ui ux design there's behavior science uh 
uh, more and more we are working with partners which come from different disciplines and i think there is a lot of uh, again power to be unleashed by put, bringing all these pieces together so when you are solving a behavioral problem we are looking at it from all these sides you know the marketing the ui ux the product the process the policy all of it together so i think there's a uh, lot more that can be done bringing you know all these disciplines together uh, as far as you know journey is concerned and you know lessons or uh, what i would say is see uh, in this field um, pragmatism i think is the most important and i guess a lot of patience because um whenever you try something in the field you know i mean the whenever you are trying something in real life whenever you are wanting to bring impact uh, there are too many uncertainties and things actually keep changing so the work is very dynamic you may start from one place and you want this perfect intervention and you have this perfect idea that you are so excited about implementing but there are many considerations in the way and by the end the the intervention may be very different from where you started but i think to be okay with that kind of um, you know you need to enjoy that sort of dynamic uh, environment be okay and not be a perfectionist because a lot of times when you are doing things on the ground when it concerns the government when it con- concerns policy you have to be more pro- pragmatic and i've often found that while you know everybody likes to innovate and come come out with exciting new ideas often it's optimization which will bring you more uh, results than innovation you know because the systems are already quite overburdened so bringing in putting in new ideas often is uh, harder but tweaking what already exists you know is always it may not be the sexier thing but it's actually sometimes more impactful so i think uh, and and the last thing i would say is that in this field um, actually two more things uh, is that uh, you fail a lot i mean because it's an experiment you know you're piloting testing there are many things that don't work but i think you have to have that mindset of being open to learning open to mistakes and i actually uh, you know there's this there's almost this joy in not knowing will this work will this not work and so you need to be excited by and be okay with actually uh, failing many times in things that you try uh and uh, yes if anyone actually wanted to get into this field i would say that since this field actually brings a lot of uh, uh, many disciplines together i think some experience or some exposure to for example how does the field of marketing works you know the the whole digital ui ux design uh, having some sort of exposure to that if you bring it all together then that's when you can actually enjoy and have the most impact in this field so uh, yeah i mean and i think you know i say that for my personal journey especially because you asked for women i would say that you know uh, the only the, the way that i look at it is that um you know when you look at your career it is um it is a more a marathon it is actually something that you need to think in much longer term uh, time frame rather than short term i think at any point of time you know i took a lot of breaks in between uh, i wanted to be there when my children were young even now you know i mean that is a big priority but the thing is that you know even if you need to take breaks i mean if you can stay connected to the field in any shape or form uh, and continue to do you know the, just uh, just stay connected and you know you will realize that your career may take many different forms i mean for me like in consulting i was from a management consulting point i was looking at insights later in brain juicer i was looking at more for private sector things now in the work that i do at csbc and also some other organizations in the dev sector so i think the shape changes but i think if you realize early on okay what's the core that i want to stick to and and remain engaged with it uh, in whatever shape or form even when you're taking a break and if that could just be learning more about it for example so i think you know that's been my mindset uh, you know through the last 20 years that uh, once i kind of understood what is it is exciting for me uh, where the nature of my engagement with that has been different but i think thing true to the core of what i enjoy which is human behavior that has been like the only thing with which i decide whether to do x or y okay thank you so much um Okay, so Pooja, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you did too. Yes, um, and thank you to the audience for listening. And um, tune in to the Carnegie India YouTube channel for more content. Okay, thank you. <laughs>